Hey everybody, welcome to chapter two. Uh, this is the lecture for chapter two. So uh, get ready and I will go through it. I don't have any other beautiful, brilliant things to say ahead of time, so just hold on to your seats. This is going to be the most exciting lecture you've ever listened to. That's probably a lie. Anyway, so chapter two is a further look at financial statements. You know, as an accounting professor, I've come to accept the fact that very few people are going to find my lectures exciting. So my goal is to make them stink less than you know than you would expect they would. If accounting is a little less stinky than you thought it would be, I guess that's a, a, that's what I'm shooting for. All right. So a further look at financial state at financial statements. All right. So there's the learning objectives. You can read them. You can pause the video if you really want to study them. There's the preview to chapter two. We're going to talk about the classified balance sheet. Uh, we've already talked about a balance sheet previously, so this will be a classified balance sheet, which is really just another way of saying a balance sheet with additional um, detail. Uh, we'll talk about some ratios that we use to analyze financial statements and understand them better. And then we'll talk about um, some concepts in financial reporting, um, kind of some boring stuff, but some important kind of concepts to understand uh, as we're digging into what financial statements are all about. So first thing you need to know about a balance sheet is that a balance sheet represents a, a snapshot in time. It doesn't measure a period of time. It doesn't say this was the assets of the business for this month. Instead it says this is the assets of the business as of this day. So balance sheets measure a point in time or a snapshot at a point in time as opposed to um, an income statement which measures a period of time. Um, and the way we do a balance sheet is we we lump all of our or group our different account types together. So assets are all lumped together, liabilities and equity are, are lumped together. And then further we lump similar types of assets together uh, such as current assets which we'll talk about more in a minute, long-term investments property, plant, and equipment, and intangible assets. Um, so that's what we're going to do now is we're going to go through each of these types of assets, general categories of assets, and try to understand them better. Remember, generally speaking, an asset is something that you own. A liability is a debt that is owed to someone else. And equity is the difference between the two, which represents the amount of the business that you own. So if a business has a certain number of assets and they use debt to pay for some of those assets, then the difference between the value of their assets and the amount of debt they have is the amount that's left over that actually belongs to the shareholders or the owners of the business. All right, so here's a classified balance sheet. You'll see that the assets section, which is up on the screen right now, is broken down into current assets and then long-term investments and then property, plant, and equipment and then intangible assets. The liability section is broken down into current liabilities, long-term liabilities, and stockholders' equity. All right, so what's a current asset? A current asset is an asset that is readily convertible to cash and that the company expects to convert to cash or use up within one year, um, typically one year. If, if the business has a longer operating cycle than a year, which is unusual, most businesses have a shorter operating cycle. Uh, operating cycle just means you start with cash, you buy inventory, you sell the inventory to customers, which turns it back into cash. Um, so that's the business or operating cycle. Most businesses have a shorter operating cycle uh, than one year. They do that multiple times over in a, in a year, but some have a longer one. Anyway, so assets that the company expects to convert to cash or use up within one year or the operating cycle, whichever is longer. So typically within a year. Um, so the most common current assets that you'll see are be cash. That's pretty current. It's already cash. Investments. Uh, those would be short-term investments, investments that we expect to turn into cash rather quickly. Receivables, like our accounts receivable, money that's owed to us that we expect to collect. And uh, prepaid expenses. So if we pay our rent or our insurance, those are the most common ones. We pay insurance for a year's worth. Well, we expect to use that insurance up within the next year. Uh, 
there's kind of what it looks like. They usually list them in the order they expect to convert them to cash, so cash comes first. A lot of times you'll see accounts receivable second. This example shows the short-term investment second. Inventories, prepaid expenses, there's the current assets. Long-term investments are just what it sounds like. Those are investments that we expect to not turn into cash any time in the next year. It includes investments in stocks and bonds of a company, of other companies, not our own, but of other companies that we've purchased for the, for the sake of investing. Long-term assets such as land or buildings that we're not using for operations. So that's a very important stipulation. If we purchase the asset with the intent of putting our store in it, we're using that asset for operating. If we purchase the asset, let's say the building, for the purpose of holding on to it for 10 years and then selling it at a profit, that's an investment. And so our intent of how we're going to use the asset matters when we're deciding how to classify it. And then long-term notes receivable. So if somebody owes us money, but we don't expect to collect on it in the next year, we'll call that a long-term investment. Property, plant, and equipment, that's property, plant, and equipment. So property, buildings, equipment that we're going to use for operations. Uh, typically, they have long, useful lives. Um, vehicles get included in this as well. And depreciation, uh, it's something we'll talk more about later in the in the book, but what we do, we depreciate the assets by spreading their cost out over their useful life. For example, if I were going to buy a building that I was going to use as a storage building and rent out to my customers, and that building was going to last for 30 years, it wouldn't make sense for me to try to take an expense for the whole cost of the building the day I buy it. That doesn't really help us figure out if we're making money or not. Instead, what we'll do is we'll divide up the value of the building over its 30-year over its useful life so that each year we're taking a portion of the building's value, 1 30th in this case, uh, as an expense, and that expense will be charged against any revenue we generate by using the building that year to give us our net income. So that's the idea behind appreciation, and we'll talk more about it, like I said, in the future. So there's a property, plant, and equipment section. You can see that all the assets are listed and then there's a little section that says less accumulated depreciation and that accumulated depreciation represents the value that we have depreciated or expensed off as we've uh, as we've held the asset and used it finally intangible assets those are assets that are intangible things we can't hold and don't really have any physical substance it includes things like patents trademarks um, goodwill other things like that so there's a list of Time Warner Inc.'s intangible assets. Current liabilities are obligations the company has to pay within the next year or operating cycle. Most common examples that you'll see are accounts payable. Accounts payable happen when a supplier provides us with goods or services and then gives us a period of time in which to pay. Um, so that's accounts payable. Salaries and wages payable, money owed to our employees. If you think about it, as soon as they work an hour, we owe them for that, but we don't pay them till payday. So we'll have a salary and wage payable, or we'll incur one each time employees work. Notes payable if they're short term, interest payable, income taxes payable. You'll notice they all have payable in their name. Um, so there's your current liabilities. And there's a part of the balance sheet that shows those current liabilities. Long-term liabilities, those are obligations we expect to pay more than a year from now. They include our bonds payable, mortgages payable, long-term notes payable, etc. And then there's an example of it right there. And then stockholders' equity, which we learned about last chapter, includes the common stock, um, which is investments by the stockholders, right? When our stockholders buy in to the company, we issue them stock, and then we list it on our balance sheet as common stock and our retained earnings, any profits earned by the company and held in the company. All right, so now we know a little bit more about what a classified balance sheet is. Again, it's just a balance sheet, but with more detail. Um, they want us to kind of talk about how we use some of this information to you know, figure out if the company is doing well or if it's healthy. So one way we do that is through ratio analysis. 
Everybody knows that a ratio is just an expression of a relationship between two numbers. And uh, so that's ratio analysis. So we'll, let's talk about a few specific types. Um, first of all, there's three broad categories. This always happens with Wiley Plus. Hold on. I don't know why, but they've set it up so that it like takes over everything on your screen. And then you've got to find where you were. All right, sorry about that. Anyway, so we break our ratios into three different types, profitability ratios, liquidity ratios, and solvency ratios. Profitability is just what it sounds like, how profitable or successful is a company, uh, especially relating to income and expenses, okay? Liquidity means how capable is a company of paying its short-term expenses. And so, yeah, well, that's what it means. And then solvency means um, how likely is the company to survive over longer periods of time. So profitability, liquidity, and solvency. All right, so here's an income statement for Best Buy. It's a comparative income statement where two years are compared side by side. You'll see their revenues their expenses, and their net income. And this is in millions. When something says it's in millions, that means you add six zeros onto the end. Okay, if it says it's in thousands, you add three zeros onto the end. It's in billions, it's nine, you get the point. All right, so there's Best Buy. So the first ratio they want us to think about is something called earnings per share, which is a profitability ratio. And that measures our profit, or net income, earned for each share of common stock. So the formula for this is our net income minus any preferred dividends, and we'll talk later about what preferred dividends are, but there's, a, there's another class of stock besides common stock called preferred stock, and if that stock pays a dividend, then that's a preferred dividend. So we just want to measure this for our, our regular common stock. So it's our net income minus any preferred dividends divided by the average common shares outstanding. So that's how we calculate earnings per share. So you see we have all this data for um, Best Buy. So if we want to do our net income minus our preferred dividends, you can see we have zero dollars in preferred dividends both years. So for 2011 our net income was 12.77 minus zero dollars in preferred dividends. And then we have to figure out our average common shares outstanding. So we do that by adding the shares at the beginning of the year plus the shares at the end of the year and dividing by two to get an average. And that's going to give us $3.14 earnings or profit per share. We can do the same for 2010, net income minus the preferred dividends. Take the beginning of the year, number of shares outstanding, end of the year, divide by two. And that gives us an earnings per share of $3.16. Are these numbers good or are they bad? It's hard to say. Um, usually you try to compare against similar companies. That helps us understand if it's a good or a bad number. You can compare against the company in a previous period. So we can say that in this case, um, Best Buy's earnings per share dropped two cents per share uh, from 2010 to 2011. All right, sometimes there's another statement that we haven't really talked about. It's called a statement of stockholders' equity. The reason companies like it is because it gives a lot more detail than the statement of retained earnings that we talked about in Chapter 1. So here's an example of a statement of stockholders' equity. You can see what it does is it breaks out the common stock into one column and the retained earnings into another. It shows you kind of a beginning balance or a balance at the beginning of the period shows you any common stock that was issued, any net income that was added to the retained earnings, any dividends that were paid out, and it gives you new balances. And so that is a statement of stockholders' equity. There's a summary of things we can learn by looking at the statement of stockholders' equity. You can read through that and roll back if you want to really study it. All right. There's our classified balance sheet. Again, this is Best Buy, Inc. Uh, 
We talked about the classified balance sheet. You can see how the assets are broken into current assets, property, plant, and equipment, other assets. There's no intangibles on this one. The liability is broken into current liabilities and long-term liabilities and stockholders' equity. So there's the classified balance sheet. So liquidity, we already mentioned liquidity is the ability to pay our short-term obligations. So some of the more common ratios that involve liquidity uh, are the working capital. It's not really a ratio, but it's the current assets. Remember, that's the assets that we expect to be turning into cash within the next year or using up within the next year. The current assets minus the current liabilities. So it's kind of like saying, how much money do we have that will be available for paying our short-term debts minus the amount of short-term debts? So if, in this case, Best Buy, um, they had 10 million 470, or I'm sorry, 10, 1,473 million, which is 10 billion, 473 million dollars in current assets and 8 billion 663 million dollars in current liabilities. So if we subtract the current liabilities from the current assets, that leaves us with 1 billion 810 million dollars in working capital or money that's available after we've satisfied all of those short-term debts. Similar is the current ratio, which instead of taking current assets minus current liabilities, it is current assets divided by current liabilities. So for 2011, we would take the $10,473 in current assets divided by the eight, well, actually it's 10 billion, right? We already figured that out. We add six zeros at the end. And the 8,663,000,000 in current liabilities, and that gives us a current ratio of 1.21. Again, is that good? Is that bad? Well, I don't know. We can see that it's better than, than they were last year. They were a 1.18 last year. Um, but this year, they are a little better. We can see that one of their competitors there is a 2 to 1. So we're not doing as good as the competitor. And we can see that the industry average is a 1.5 to 1. So we're not even doing as good as the average in the industry. So Best Buy probably has some improvement to do. Remember, higher is better, because what that means is your current assets, the money you have available to pay the short-term debts, is higher relative to your current liabilities or the actual short-term debts. The higher that number, the better your capacity to pay those short-term debts. Is there a point at which it's too high? Sure. If you've got tons and tons of money sitting there, you may be able to use it in better ways. But typically speaking, higher is better. All right. And then solvency, if you remember, we said that has to do with our ability to pay long-term debt and survive over the long term. That's what a solvency ratio is. So one solvency ratio is a debt to assets ratio, which is your total debt or total liabilities, divided by your total assets. So for Best Buy, they had total liabilities of 10 billion 557 million. They had total assets of 17 billion 849 million, and that gives them a 59 percent debt to asset ratio. You can see that last year they were 62 percent. We can see that the competitor is 42 percent, and the industry average is 57 percent. Now think about what this is telling us. The higher this number, the higher our liabilities are in relation to our assets. So this is one that we want to see lower most of the time. There's a time to have you know, a little bit more debt or a little less. But typically speaking, again, we're a little above the industry average and quite a bit above our competitor. Uh, but we're lower than we were last year, which means we're making an improvement. It means for every dollar of assets they have, they finance that for, with 59 cents of debt. So if you think about that, that means if you had a 50% or a 0.5 debt to asset ratio, that would mean in essence that, that 50 cents for every, was financed for every dollar of assets you have. All right, and the statement from the statement of cash flows, we can do what's called the free cash flow. That's, that helps us sort of have an idea of how much money we have available uh, for spending on other things. Our free cash flow is our cash provided by operations. 
minus capital expenditures, that's money we have to spend on property, plant, and equipment usually, minus cash dividends. So here's their example. MPC produced and sold 10,000 personal computers this year, reported 100,000 cash provided by operating activities. In order to maintain production at 10,000 computers, MPC invested 15,000 in equipment. It chose to pay 5,000 in dividends, calculate free cash flow. So we have the cash provided by operating activities of 100,000, less expenditures on property, plant, and equipment, my, um, plus the dividends paid. That should be minus dividends paid. That, that confused me too. Um, and that gives them their free cash flow. All right. So let's move on to financial reporting concepts. And I'll try to go through this quickly because this is the part. If the last part was a snoozer, this is like a double snoozer. Uh, and I'm not advocating energy drinks at all. So just be aware that you need to focus to, to stay up with this stuff. So we already know that GAAP, or Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, is a set of rules that govern American accounting. Okay? There are some standard setting bodies or agencies that create the rules um, for the Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. These include the Securities and Exchange Commission, the FASB, or the Financial Accounting Standards Board, um, the IASB, the International Accounting Standards Board, and the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. Whew, that's a lot to say. You'll also notice that over 115 countries use international standards called IFRS, or International Financial Reporting Standards, which are different than the GAAP rules in the United States. All right. So according to the FASB, that's the Financial Accounting Standards Board, useful information from an accounting perspective has to possess two fundamental qualities. And they are relevance and faithful representation. Relevance means the information would make a difference in a business decision. Remember, accounting is sort of a language we use to communicate the financial situation of a business. So when deciding, should I be reporting this information, the question is, is it relevant? Or does it make a difference in a business decision? Faithful representation means is the information accurately depict what really happened in real life. It's easy to kind of sometimes, kind of sometimes I said, make up numbers that don't necessarily um, match up with what would happen in real life. That means we want it to be neutral and free from error and free from bias. We want it to be a faithful representation of what really happened. So relevant and faithful representation. There's additional enhancing qualities. The information should be comparable, meaning we could compare the information from one company to another or within the same company over different periods of time. Verifiable, meaning we can prove that the information actually is what we said it is. It has to be understandable so that anybody looking at it that has a little bit of sophistication can figure out what we're doing. Consistent, meaning we're using the same principles from year to year or from period to period and timely, reported in a reasonable amount of time. All right. Also, there's some assumptions, basic assumptions we make in financial reporting. The first is what's called the monetary unit assumption. What this means is that we can express the measurements we're making in monetary units. In the United States, that's dollars. In other countries, they have their monetary units. The second is the economic entity assumption. That means that we can account for each economic entity separately. They use the example of some American car makers there. Uh, they are distinct corporations uh, for whom we can account for separately and distinctly. Periodicity, that means that the life of the business can be divided into artificial time periods. Most of the time, we divide business segments, or not segments, but operations into annual time periods, quarterly time periods, monthly time periods, etc. Sometimes even down to a day. But usually it's months, quarters, and years. Going concern means the businesses we work with, we expect or believe they'll remain in operation for the foreseeable future. These are the measurement principles when we're dealing with assets. We want to usually, typically, we record them at their historical cost. 
or what they cost us to acquire. Certain assets are recorded at fair value, what they're worth at the market. Usually that's assets that we can have a distinct and clear understanding of what their fair market value is. The stock of another company is pretty easy to market if they're publicly traded. We can just look at their stock price, multiply that by the number of shares we have, and then we can report the, the fair value of that stock. But a 1978 delivery truck may be very hard to know what the fair value is. And so typically we list that at historical cost. And then full disclosure just requires that we disclose all the information necessary that would help other users of the information make reasonable decisions. Um, under cost constraint, uh, accounting standard setters weigh the cost that companies will incur to provide the information against the benefit the financial statement users will gain from having the information available. In other words, it's important that we report things, but there has to be a reasonable cost and benefit to it. All right. The last little section is a look at IFRS, or the International Financial uh, Reporting Standards. And it just kind of compares them with uh, the GAAP, or Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. So a couple things. I don't want to read them all to you. But so, like for example, IFRS, they like to call a balance sheet a statement of financial position rather than a balance sheet. Okay, IFRS puts, them in a, puts the assets and liabilities in a slightly different order, where they do non-current assets first and current assets second, as opposed to under GAAP, what we just saw, where the current assets are first and the non-current or long-term assets are second, et cetera. So there's another difference. Um, IFRS requires a classified statement of financial position, uh, which just means that balance sheet with more detail. Um, again, under IFRS, current assets are usually listed in reverse order of liquidity, whereas under GAAP, we start with the most liquid, like cash, and move on. Um, differences in terminology, as you can imagine. Instead of calling it common stock, they call it shares, okay, but it's still the same stuff. Uh, the second bullet point there, both GAAP and IFRS are increasing the use of fair value to report assets uh, as examples, blah, 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 okay? In other words, I just mentioned that we usually record things under GAAP at their cost unless we can really have a clear view of what the fair value of the asset is. Well, under IFRS, it's the opposite. Most things are carried at their fair value, and so it has to be this reasonable estimate of what fair value is. Uh, and increasingly, they're both both the United States and the international are moving toward uh, the fair value idea, uh, which leads you to the third bullet point, which is the IA, IASB and the FASB, so International Accounting Standards Board um, and the Financial Accounting Standards Board are kind of moving together so that at some point we will probably see the United States and many of our international partners using the same accounting standards. Right now, it's a little confusing sometimes, as you can imagine. Um, the first one there is kind of obvious. You could read through that if you want to. And then, looking into the future, like I just said, IASB, FASB are working together to converge the standards. Um, and we'll have the same format, which will kind of change everything we're teaching. Because right now, we have to prepare American accountants to deal with the American way of doing things, but make them aware that there's an international way that's slightly different. And I imagine international accountants have to be prepared to do things in the international way, but be prepared to deal with the American way if they work with American companies. So uh, eventually, the, the plan is to have a single standard and, and a similar looking statement. And that's it. Uh, like I said, I hope it didn't stink as bad as it had to. Um, I know it probably wasn't the most exciting thing you did today, but hopefully it was valuable to you. Have a great week, and good luck on all the homework, uh, and, well, just have a great week.